Hello and welcome. This is uh, paper 10, module 34 and my name is Professor Rashmi Raman. Today we will be discussing a topic whose title is Contemporary Conflicts and Possibilities in International Intervention, Part 1. In this Part 1, I will be taking you through contemporary conflicts and possibilities of intervention in Syria and Iraq. As usual, let us start by looking at what are the possible learning outcomes in this module. Firstly, for you to understand the nature and the possible resolution of the conflicts in Syria and Iraq as different but related instances of international intervention. We will begin this module by studying a background on Syria and then looking at a background on Iraq. Thirdly, we will look at the International Criminal Court and organs of the United Nations. Fifthly, we will look at domestic courts and ad hoc tribunals. Finally, I will bring you to the conclusion in this module. Let us begin with Syria. An introduction to Syria must begin by stating that Syria is officially known as the Syrian Arab Republic. It is located in Western Asia where it shares its borders with Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, Israel and the Mediterranean Sea. While being a land of diverse ethnicity, including Arabs, Turks, Greeks, Armenians, Kurds, etc., the largest population of Syria is made up of Sunni Arabs. Recently, from 2006, to up about 2011, Syria suffered a devastating drought, which is said to have been the worst and the longest ever recorded. Syria is densely populated despite its lack of resources. This imbalance causes problems in matters of resource division and other administrative issues, which make the relationship between the government and the public extremely volatile in modern day Syria. What is the political history of Syria? Now, Syria had become an independent republic in the year 1946. This was followed by years of political instability with various uprisings and coups to overthrow uh, leaders that came one after another to rule the land. However, in 1970, Hafiz Assad declared himself the president. He held this position, which he had declared, until his death in 2000, after which Bashar Assad, his son, took over as the new president, this time not through declaration, but through lineage. The Assad family belongs to the minority Alawite religious group. They are an offshoot of Shiite Islam which consists of only 12% of the total population of Syria. As I told you before, Syria is a predominantly Sunni state. The Alawites have maintained power and authority over the Sunni Muslims who dominate Syria by three-fourths of the total population. Other religious minorities also have constantly protested and complained about religious and ethnic discrimination and the denial of their political and cultural rights. There have been severe restrictions on rights of free expression, rights of association and other freedoms. Discrimination against women and ethnic minorities is common. Protests and demands for human rights were curbed by military force in modern day Syria as they had been during the time that the emergency was in operation. Let us now turn to the backdrop of the actual conflict in Syria. At the backdrop is the Arab Spring, where many Middle Eastern countries and Western European, West Asian countries were facing uprisings and protests against their central governments. Syria also had its share of this uprising. The protest started on March 15, 2011. When protesters marched into the capital city of Damascus, their demands were democratic reforms, the release of political prisoners, more freedom, 
abolition of the emergency state and an end to corruption. The government of Syria, in response to this, resorted to military action and violent means to curb the protests. After a month, the emphasis of the protests escalated and gradually shifted towards the call for removing and overthrowing the Assad government. The protests spread throughout the country over a period of time and the violent resistance of the government also increased. The death toll continued to rise, bombings continued to lead to destruction and the government continued its quest to protect its supremacy by using force. Throughout the course of the civil war and continuing war crimes and human rights violations that took place in the territory of Syria, both sides have been responsible. To make things settle down gradually, one of the positive steps that needs to be taken is to convict the perpetrators of war crimes and to create an avenue for justice for the victims of the civil war. How do you do this? And most importantly, how do you do this when the host state is not ready? Through foreign intervention. Both the Syrian government and the opposition have received support, military and diplomatic, from foreign countries, leading to what is now known as a proxy war. States like the United States of America, France and Britain have been in support of the opposition rebels in Syria. On the other hand, Russia has been providing military support to the actual government in force in Syria. Initially, many Middle Eastern countries expressed support for the Syrian government. However, as the death toll and the violence rose, they switched to a balanced stance. Meanwhile, many Western governments, the United Nations, the Arab League and the European Union condemned the violent response of the Syrian government. The global community, by and large, expressed support for the pro protesters' demand for rights. China, Russia and the United States could have vetoed a number of Security Council resolutions and in fact they used the veto power to bring about non-military intervention. While the coalition led by the United States believes that Assad-led Syrian government should step down, China and Russia believe that the United Nations Security Council resolutions are one-sided in blaming the Assad government for all the destruction without acknowledging the role of opposition rebellion in civilian suffering. This has brought international diplomacy to a potential stalemate. Over 57 states, including permanent members of the Security Council, have urged the United Nations Security Council to refer Syria to the International Criminal Court as an alternative avenue of ending the conflict. Syria will come under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court only if it submits itself or if the United Nations Security Council refers it to the International Criminal Court because Syria has not ratified the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Once the matter is with the International Criminal Court legitimately, then it can investigate possible violations of international law, including international criminal law, committed by any relevant actor from within Syrian politics. However, it would be difficult to get uh, the necessary consensus of votes for a referral for the same reason as the United Nations Security Council has failed to pass resolutions in this favor. The ICC could not investigate actions on non-state members and such restrictions undermine the concept of equality before the law. Further, this has made the situation marginally worse as there was some legal levy for non-state members to commit crimes. Such bargains politicize a neutral and independent body and they tarnish the integrity of the notion of equality before the law. Such actions may further also be harmful for the credibility of a body as important as the International Criminal Court. Another judicial approach 
towards international intervention is the usage of pol national prosecuting authorities of foreign courts, that is courts outside of Syria, as long as the issue falls under one of the several principles of extraterritorial jurisdiction. For example, Sweden recently applied universal jurisdiction to the Syria conflict and they convicted a rebel for war crimes. Though this may seem like a valid option, there are certain clear and coherent international barriers that need to be surpassed, which is highly unlikely. Sovereign immunity shields most of the highest officials, while difficulties may arise in trying suspects in absentia. Also, international actors will question the evidence on qualitative and quantitative levels, whether such evidence would be sufficient to deliver a conviction or not. The subjectivity in this approach and the lack of coherence in the conception of justice will definitely bring up certain ethical and practical challenges. Of late, the debate for securing justice in Syria has escalated into the possibility of creating a tribunal for Syria. Proponents suggest a hybrid nature and flexibility of the tribunal where they can combine international as well as domestic laws which allow for the possibility of a greater number of trials as compared to the International Criminal Court. The proposition is such that it widens the jurisdiction of such a tribunal to try a variety of cases including everybody involved. The idea of such a tribunal was conceived of after the drafting of what came to be known as the Chataokwa Blueprint in August 2013. Yet, on a practical level, such a plan does not seem feasible, nor does it seem like a politically prudent route towards achieving accountability for the victims of the Syrian crisis. The hostility in the extant territory of Syria is such that it does not allow for the peaceful existence of any international body or for the peaceful settlement of disputes which have to be first acknowledged to have been disputes unless there is a hypothetical internationally uh, protected buffer zone created. The creation of such a buffer zone in the Syrian context seems highly unlikely. Therefore, another proposal that we can consider is to set up a tribunal for Syria, not in the territory of Syria, but in the territory of a neighboring sovereign country. However, transcending through the political dynamics of the United Nations as well as the potential difficulties of convincing a neighboring state to take political or financial or logistical burdens of the tribunal upon itself would be very difficult to impose. In addition, the implementation of sanctions and the judgments of this tribunal would be another concern. The lack of effectiveness of such a tribunal could lead to the worsening of conditions of the people of Syria as well as an increase in the crime rate as it takes place in today's Syria. That despite the urgency of pursuing justice and accountability immediately, the best way forward is to postpone any hasty international intervention. With loopholes and flaws in almost all avenues that we have discussed. It is necessary for the global community to follow a cost-benefit analysis and negate the possibility of any further harm. Though justice may be one way forward towards enabling the sufferings of Syrians and of the Sunni majority in Syria, more substantial steps need to be deliberated upon and a more circumspect perspective needs to be taken to end the civil war. Any method which is premature or suffers from the political flaws such as the methods we have outlined has the possi possibility of facing adversity in a conflict hit land like Syria where it also has a huge risk of backfiring. We need to be careful as we tread towards international intervention in such conflict ridden areas. However, it is important to act quickly and not procrastinate too much before matters get substantively worse. Iraq is another country in the western part of Asia. It is bordered by Turkey, Iran, 
Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Jordan and the country that we have just discussed before this, Syria. The main terrain largely comprises of deserts and mountains. The concentration of fertile land or arable land is centered around the two main rivers. Most of Iraq experiences a hot and arid climate with low rainfall and severe cold harsh winters with occasional heavy snowing. The famous civilization of Mesopotamia was historically located in the fertile regions that is the fertile valley of the two rivers where it is believed that humanity first settled down and lived in organized cities, created laws and had a government. Since then, at different points in the history of Iraq, Iraq has been the center of many civilizational attempts and many successive civilizations such as the Sumerians and the Babylonian empires have settled there, followed by Romans, Mongols, the Medians, the Afsharids and the Ottoman empires. As you can see, Iraq is geographically, politically and historically an extremely centrally powerful country. Iraq is home to a large population of Arabs and Kurds. Most of the people there are either Shia or Sunni Muslim, while Armenians, Turkmenistans, Yazidis, etc. make up the minority ethnicities. Over time, due to raging conflicts and disturbances within the country, a large part of the population has fled the state. While also, a large number of Syrian refugees that emerged from the Syrian civil war have migrated to Iraq as a spillover of the Syrian civil war. Let us now consider the political history of modern day Iraq. Iraq obtained independence in 1932 after being under the rule of the British Empire. Since independence, Iraq remains under the rule of the monarchy for many, many years. However, in 1958, a coup overthrew, overthrew the monarchy. Following, there was a rapid change of power through different presidents until Saddam Hussein came into power and took control of the Revolutionary Command Council of Iraq in 1979. Under the leadership of Saddam Hussein, Iraq saw hostile international relations while they waged war with Kuwait, Iran and Israel. To add to the miseries already existing from this war, Shias and Kurds led several religious uprisings against Saddam Hussein, which the state repressed using Iraqi military as well as chemical weapons. This hostile phase throughout the later part of the 20th century led to the mass destruction and loss of lives on a large scale. To protect the interests of the helpless Iraqi civilians who were being suppressed violently by the Saddam Hussein regime, countries such as uh, France, the United States, the United Kingdom and Turkey established a no-fly zone in Iraq. This was followed by commands from the United Nations to the Saddam government to disarm and destroy its chemical weapons and enter into a ceasefire agreement. The government's failure to disarm resulted in the imposition of sanctions by the United Nations. Despite such international interventions of these powerful countries on humanitarian grounds, the tension between the authoritative government and the local rebel groups continued. After the 9-11 attacks, today we are commemorating in fact our 16th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on the Twin Towers, the Bush-led US government started to plan to overthrow the Saddam government. In March 2003, the United States organized a coalition which invaded Iraq with the reasoning that Iraq had violated the United Nations resolution by not abandoning its weapons of mass destruction. Further, the United States claimed that they wanted to restore democracy and peaceful conditions of life um, to the citizens of Iraq in the name of the restoration of democracy, the US established a coalition provisional authority whereby the existing Iraqi army was disbanded and other government officials were stopped from participating in the country's governance. This led to chaotic post-invasion environment 
To cut a long story short, the uprisings of the Arab Spring also had a spillover effect in Iraq. What we are really disputing here today is whether international intervention in Iraq led to a peaceful settlement of the dispute in Iraq and whether the conflict in Iraq benefited from the upheaval and instability that was created by uh, the in intervention. The Islamic State of Iraq and Levant, ISIL, also known as ISIS, orchestrated several bombings and demonstrations leading to destruction. They are a jihadist extremist military group, mostly comprising of Sunni Arabs who are self-proclaimed caliphates. This emerged as an offshoot of Al-Qaeda, the terrorist group. They have aims to unite the entire Arab world and all the Muslim population in the world in the name of Muhammad. What I would have liked you to have learned from this module and to have studied is whether this kind of checkered history in Iraq benefited from intervention and whether the intervention created peace. Now this is widely an open conclusion and one that you can draw on your own. But before you draw your conclusion, please remember that there are important similarities and differences between Syria and Iraq. The first of these differences is that geographically, Syria and Iraq are comparable states. But historically, the conflict in Iraq is far more deep-rooted in religion than the one in Syria. A second commonality between them is the idea of the Arab Spring and the fueling by the Arab Spring. That is, human rights violations created by citizens who are really oppressed and who are disillusioned because they're unemployed and um, undereducated. These are the things that tie the Iranian and the Iraqian and the Syrian conflict together. At the same time, there are important distinctions between the two. The first of them is the involvement of terrorist groups or non-state actors in the Iraqi conflict. And thirdly, when you evaluate the possibility of international intervention, I want you also to look at the possibility of creating a tribunal in Syria. The idea came from the international community, but no such idea has been flouted for um, Iraq. Why is that? Consider these carefully when you draw your conclusions. Thank you.